Very excited to be here, everybody. Uh, as mentioned, I am Courtney Nichols. I'm a partner at Plunkett Cooney. I am one of the co-leaders of Plunkett Cooney's Labor and Employment Practice Group. That is where I uh, specialize. I do almost exclusively employment law, um, both outside of the firm and internally for Plunkett Cooney. I started with Plunkett Cooney. I've stayed with Plunkett Cooney going on 10 years now. Um, it's all I've ever known. And I, I think that um, so far, so good. I, I have a, a unique perspective coming sort of from the bottom there. I started as a billing clerk before I went to law school and then came back as a summer associate, was brought on board as an associate and made uh, what we call our tier one or our equity partner in 2017. So I'm really excited to be here today to answer some questions and to talk about you know, this, this always evolving and very interesting topic. We thank you so much, Courtney, for being here with us tonight. By way of introduction, this is the inaugural session of WLLM's Fearless Conversations. I'm Christina Billis and will serve as the moderator for tonight's discussion. And Fearless Conversations is the brainchild of the WLAM Programming Committee. It's built on three simple yet significant questions. What conversations do women lawyers have with colleagues that seem to be on replay? Two, what are the lawyerly topics we only discuss in our homes but yet avoid at the office? And three, what are we afraid to ask about and even talk about with our male counterparts? And so WLAM selects the content that answers these pivotal questions. These sessions are recorded and archived in the hopes of creating a library of information for those currently in the legal profession and for those yet to come. And in so doing, we empower our female law students, lawyers, and judges alike by learning together, leaning on each other, and ultimately lifting each other up. So ultimately, what is our goal? In the words of WLAM Director Tanya Grillo, Let's dig deep and get real. Tonight's session features the WLAM Gender Equity Committee with a spotlight on our compensation questions and self-advocacy in salary negotiations, particularly from a big law standpoint. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Courtney Nichols from Plunkett Cooney, who we just heard from a moment ago. Now, Courtney is very humble. She did not share all these other things. So I just wanna take a brief moment to indicate that Ms. Nichols serves as a co-leader of Plunkett Cooney's Labor and Employment Law Practice Group. And she's a member of the firm's Bloomfield Hills office. She focuses her litigation practice in the area of employment law, including discrimination, retaliation, civil rights claims. She also provides counsel to employers of all sizes regarding complicated employment and labor issues prior to litigation, including compliance with the ADA, FMLA, and FLSA. She frequently represents clients in drafting and enforcing contractual agreements, including covenants not to compete and severance agreements involving executives. Furthermore, Courtney has outstanding representative client work, is a noteworthy lecturer, published author, award recipient, and involved in numerous professional activities and leadership roles. And so it is absolutely a pleasure to have her here with us today and having this conversation is our inaugural session for Fearless Conversations. And so to kick us off, I know Courtney shared a little bit about her firm, but maybe we can turn the conversation to describing the compensation model at Plunkett Cooney, how they've adopted it to recognize contribution of its attorneys. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we are a mid-sized law firm. We typically hover around 150 attorneys, um, about 300 employees. Sometimes we get up a in the 350 range when we include all support staff and paralegals. And the way that our attorney compensation is, is generally structured is based on a matrix. And we're pretty transparent about this compensation structure. The matrix is published, it's not a secret. Uh, you know, If you're an associate, you can get your hands on it. The partners have to evaluate themselves based on the matrix. And it sounds like something sort of ridiculous. I don't know if you came up with the title, but uh, it, it's a point system. So we get points based on a number of factors, obviously cash receipts, because we are a defense firm, um, you know, billing is a critical component of our business model. But we also get points based on leverage, origination, ownership, and then there's a number of other factors, quality, leadership, and commitment to the firm. So when we look at the matrix factors, it's not a system that is only going to reward the people that are billing the most and bringing in the most receipts. In fact, I think our highest paid attorney last year is somebody that is not a significant biller, as one would say, but somebody with a, a really good book of business 
who then farms that work out to other people and has been responsible for hiring numerous associates and partners over the last three to five years. So that model is really set up to encourage people to expand their horizons by bringing in clients, giving it to other people to work on, and then to, to commit themselves to the quality, to the leadership within the firm, because you're gonna get rewarded for those efforts through the points that will be assessed your matrix score. And ultimately at year end, we have a salary and bonus committee that sits down and it's not just a totally discretionary process whereby three people that you may or may not know at a bigger or mid-sized firm are throwing a number at the wall and seeing what sticks. They're looking at your matrix points and they're comparing that to other people within the firm to assess what makes most sense in terms of your compensation moving forward and your value to the firm. You can also use those matrix points year after year to demonstrate your growth and how your career is progressing. So it's a helpful tool that really allows not only you to be where you're at in terms of other people, but uh, you to, to sort of have an understanding of where these different components of the practice of law are gonna come in and ultimately benefit you. And our, our system has recently changed. So it, before there were caps on certain things, which we found to be stifling. And there were a number of complaints about that. Like for example, there's a cap on the points that you would receive for leverage. So after a certain point, you sort of disincentivized from leveraging work to other attorneys within the firm. And you might be more incentivized to keep some of that work for yourself, which could have a negative impact on an attorney that's trying to engage in more rainmaking and less grinding, so to speak. So the cap was removed. Um, after numerous concerns were raised about what that long-term effect might be. And so now you're really uncapped in terms of your potential uh, compensation relative to leverage and origination. So for me, for example, you know, I have told my CEO, my managing partner to his face, now it's a guy that I love, and you know, he's been my mentor the entire time I've been there, but I've told him, I'm never working more hours than what I've worked the past two years. It's plain not happening. So I am not probably going to see a significant increase in my cash receipts unless I get rate increases, which always helps. But I'm also not a person that's not going to want my salary to increase. There are some attorneys at Plunkett Cooney and any place you go to that said, listen, I want this salary. I don't want to work any harder than that. I don't want to make more. I don't care. That's not me. I'm a psychotic competitive. So I'm constantly wanting to do more and to make more and to be better. So I have said, listen, I know where my end game is in terms of actual working. Now, how am I going to increase my bottom line? I have to leverage more and I have to you know, bring in more work from an origination standpoint and continue to increase my ownership categories, my quality and my commitment to the firm by way of leadership through things like the practices of leadership. So that's a somewhat long-winded answer, but it's a, it's a pretty um, unique, transparent, black and white compensation system that we have that allows attorneys doing dramatically different things to really succeed uh, in very different ways. Fantastic. And it sounds like it's a model that everyone can know and understand. And you have actually leveraged it to your understanding and how you do your work and engage with that model. How, from the standpoint of other attorneys, if at all, are they involved in this process? And to that extent, how do they make their contributions known to the firm? Yep, so our system is set up uh, where we have what I mentioned before, the salary and bonus committee. So it's sort of layered, okay? So we have a board of directors that is 11 people. They really have nothing to do with the process other than you know reviewing the final numbers and rubber stamping things. And then you have committee assignments. So we have a salary and bonus committee that is comprised of rotating shareholders. So there are generally, I think, four shareholders and then our managing partner who just sits there as a presence on the salary and bonus committee. And the salary and bonus committee hears reports from the department leaders who are charged with making sure that they understand their attorneys and their attorney's performance, in addition to presenting the actual written year-end evaluations. So the department leaders and the practice group leaders working together are able to review the evaluations, assess where everybody's falling on our matrix or in terms of you know, what, are they, what value are they bringing to the firm and then present that information to a committee that assesses salary increases if applicable, bonuses if applicable. So it's a, it's a process whereby 
you have layers, which to some might seem like a necessary bureaucracy, but to others, it's a way to ensure that the information is being presented in a consistent, concise manner and that everybody has an opportunity to be heard. We don't want, candidly, 130 attorneys coming into a salary and bonus committee and, and you know, making their pitch in terms of compensation packages because it would be totally unruly. There's just no way that we could reasonably wrap our arms around that. So we have this process where we task leadership with understanding the attorneys in their group and being able to uh, advocate on their behalf. Great, really appreciate that thorough uh, explanation. Now turning specifically to the topic of, of women because this is our inaugural session of Fearless Conversations and for, through WLAM, how do you think women can be better advocates for themselves during the interview process? Yeah, that's, that's a question that we get a lot. And from my perspective, as a group leader that has to hear the, the presentations that are coming to me, I am a big fan of data and uh, demonstrating a progression and demonstrating an end game. So for example, I tell the attorneys that are reporting to me, please tell me how much better you did this year than you did last year, because then I can go and tell the department leader that. And if you've improved in these areas, 10, 15, 20%, then I, I have a much better argument to make when I ask for you to get a 10, 15, whatever percentage salary increase, right? If you just come to me and say, I want X and I'm doing these five things, but I can't see what that means in terms of a, in a, a career progression, and potential improvement down the line, then I don't have a lot of ammunition to take when I argue on your behalf. Um, and candidly, you don't either. It's, it's, you know, just picking a number out of thin air doesn't help. So I always look at percentage increases. I've always done that for my reviews, right? Like I've improved my client base by 10% year to date. My, you know, my billable units have gone up 15%. I also track it against goals. Now, I am one that the goals are sort of meaningless to me, and I think that most people at big and mid-sized law firms will tell you the same thing. If you get goals, that's fine, but like, it's not, the point of a goal is not so for you to be one hour over or one dollar over it. You know, it's typically a budgeting metric, but with that said, I do usually show like I'm 10%, 15%, 20% over my goal, which is a consistent trend. So, you know, when I was up for partner, I went in there and I had six years of data that demonstrated the, the, that there was a trajectory here and it was not a one year blip and that there was never a goal that I was even close to falling underneath and I'm gonna continue to rise. Because when, it, from a leadership perspective, when I'm trying to figure out, am I gonna invest in you and give you a salary? I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm getting in at the right time, right? Like when you buy a house, you don't wanna buy a house right now when the market is insane and you're gonna pay the highest price if you know you're moving it to you. Now, if you're buying a house that's gonna be your forever home, you're probably more inclined to bite that bullet and to get the mortgage and to do it because you want to live there. But if you know that something's tenuous, why would you invest in it? So my number one tip is have the metrics, have the data ready to go and explain to me in you know, the concisest way possible why investing in you now is the right thing to do. Great information we can all take and learn from. Now, you may include this as part of the annual review process, but do you have any specific recommendations for how women can be better self-advocates during the annual review? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the good thing for me, it, at least from what I've seen, is when people come in and they're realistic, okay? So I always try to come in and be grounded and I've never come in and made a demand that I know is outrageous. So I think to be a good advocate for yourself, you have to know your audience and you have to know where your thresholds are. So for example, if, if I were to come into Plunkett Cooney and to demand a $500,000 salary, I'd get laughed out of the room. So I sort of have a feel for where attorneys are at that firm in relation to me and what value I might bring that's different to theirs or, or alternatively comparable. So I know we're probably going to get to this later, but I think that it's totally fine if you have uh, people at your firm or that you work with that sort of have a range of information regarding compensation packages to discuss it and to figure out like, where do I fit in this big picture? So that you're not coming in 
and, and advocating for a position that's never going to happen. Because when somebody comes in and, and says, I want X, and it's never happened for anybody like them before them, it's not happening to anybody like them now, it's not even a discussion, it's a non-starter. So I think it's good to have, again, that benchmarking analysis to the extent we possibly can and to demonstrate why what I'm asking for is reasonable. Uh, and in terms, not just of you know, general market data, but this firm. Because again, like I, I've had people say, you know, the market for this position is X, Y, or Z. That doesn't matter really to your firm leadership. Like Plunkett Cooney isn't going to care what you know, a, a national from Jones Day is paying their second year associate because Plunkett Cooney is not a national firm. Okay. So like coming in and me saying, I want to get paid the same as a person I graduated with law school with in Chicago, who's at Jones Day is not moving any needle. It's not doing anything for me. So the benchmarking in terms of your audience and your particular firm situation is, is to me the number one step to really being a good advocate for yourself in terms of salary, bonuses, those type of things. Great, and I, I really appreciate the, the tempered approach that you take and you encourage others, a measured approach, do an educational background of, of trying to figure out where you are so that it is a measured approach when you're going into these discussions. Kind of flipping the script a little bit, do you ever find the concept of women, in quote, betting against themselves, in quote, to be prevalent in compensation negotiations? And if so, what can we be doing as women in the profession to overcome that? Yeah, so I mean, the concept of you coming in and you, you undervaluing yourself or um, you know, not, not necessarily giving yourself the credit you deserve. I think one of the things that you can do that would be particularly helpful and not to be you know, this drum too much, but that benchmarking. Like there is a male attorney that shall not be named at Plunkett Cooney that started two years before me um, that sort of was on a similar trajectory. And you better believe I had a general understanding of you know, where he was at in terms of our structure so that I knew where I could be at without unnecessarily coming in at too low of a number. Fantastic. And I, I think really the, the message here is having that, that tempered measured approach, do your research beforehand so that you have a better chance of A, being taken seriously and B, also getting what you're, you're wanting. So turning to now having sit on both sides of the table, you're part of that decision-making process and also self-advocating. What are some of the mistakes commonly seen during salary discussions, either during hiring or during a review process? Mm -hmm. And how do we avoid them? The first one is overinflated demands. I mean, I'll just tell you, like, and, and I know that sort of sounds probably counterintuitive because we just talked about the betting against yourself, but there is a happy medium there. There's nuance. Nuance is your friend, both as an attorney and as a negotiator. So I've sat through countless interviews where we hear people come in and we know they're lying about what they're making or what they want to make or what they heard they should make or something like that. And it's just like, it just doesn't move any needles, right? There's nobody that's persuaded by that. And once you lose credibility, it becomes very hard in negotiations. So I equate, you know, our salary negotiations to any other type of negotiation we have at Plunkett Cooney. And if I'm before a judge or a mediator and the mediator thinks like, yeah, right, Miss Nichols, like there's no way that fact's not going to come out. That's not going to be shown. That's not what the witness testified to. Everything else I say past that point is like the teacher from uh, the, the cartoon, you know, what I'm talking about where it's just like, there's, there's no point. It's just wow, wow, wow. So I always say that, you know, I don't generally love when people come in and ask for a particular number unless it's well researched and there's a particular reason for it. Um, so saying, you know, this is what I think, or this is what I'm making, and this is a progression, or this is why it's different here. I'm going to be asked to work 200 more hours at this hourly rate. This is what my bottom line is. Coming in, you know, at last year, I built 1,800 hours. If I bill out at a $200 an hour hourly rate, I'm going to have received a 360. My overhead is X. That's always, to me, the, the best approach to make. The biggest mistake is just coming in and saying, I demand Y because I think that's what I should get, or just plain lying about current salary. So it's really easy to find what the current salary information is. And so over inflating that is a problem. Definitely hearing the message of ladies, let's do our research and well heated, good advice indeed. Shifting gears a little bit and, and turning to the top, uh, topic of allyship, 
how can women be allies for each other, either supporting the advancement and recognition in our workplace, but also in the legal community overall? I think that it's important for all women to, I mean, I, to support each other to a maximum extent. I've never once told um, anybody at my firm that I should get paid more than another woman or that another woman's overpaid or something along those lines. I don't see any benefit in doing that. For me, for example, I have sat in on multiple of my own salary and bonus review meetings. And I've heard my co-practice group leader say, before I say anything about myself, I want to tell you about Courtney. And so she does that for me every single year, usually with a little phrase about Courtney is severely underpaid and you guys need to make it right, which is always helpful, right? And so I do the same thing for her. And I would tell any of my other colleagues, I hope you're doing the same thing. When you go and say, listen, I want to talk about this group of people I'm working with. If you have a close relationship with another attorney, then I think that you should be constantly pushing and saying, this is somebody that we can't afford to lose. This is somebody that we need to keep here because that's what it ultimately boils down to. Compensation oftentimes goes hand in glove with retention. So I make a note to try to prop my people up if I know. Now, now I don't go into my salary and bonus and start talking about my best friend at the firm who's a no-fault attorney. I know that she's brilliant and does a great job, but I don't work with her and I couldn't possibly evaluate how she's doing other than looking at the numbers. But for the people that I actually know, that I trust, that are doing a great job, I think the more you prop other people up, the more that's going to be reciprocated. And that, you know, I, I, I do think too that there's strength in numbers. So when you're presenting that to management, that we have a united front, like me and my co-practice group leader, we are united. We are in lockstep. So if you make one of us upset, you're going to make both of us upset. Likewise, if one of us is thrilled, there's a good chance the other one will be a cheerleader. So strength in numbers cannot go uh, understated, in my opinion. And really, just it comes back to you, too. And not, not that not trying to sound like too much of a hippie, but from a universe perspective, the more good you put out there, the more good you're going to get back in turn. I really like that phrase, the united front, um, and, and having that solidarity as, as a team. Now, does, this, does that statement impact the following question? Do you recommend salary discussions among coworkers or peers? Why or why not? So if you would have asked me this seven years ago, I would have been like, absolutely not. Now keep in mind, I'm an employment attorney. Okay. So I will, I have to deal with clients calling me all the time saying, you know, so-and-so is discussing this and it's rumors and it's not true. I also have to deal with some pushback at my own firm about like, well, once so-and-so finds out how much X is making, it's an issue. I think you should do it. Okay. Where I am at now as a partner at this firm I have found tremendous value in doing that, both in understanding that I am compensated appropriately and on rare occasions where I've had questions about my compensation, knowing what I can do to ask about it or to potentially have it rectified. Now at Plunkett, partners have full access to everything. So it's transparent, but associates don't, right? Like if you're an associate at Plunkett, you can't go onto the EIS system and find out what somebody else is making. But we started talking about it. So you know, other, uh, same type of thing, other attorneys two or three years above me or two or three years below me would, would share the information if they wanted to, nobody ever felt compelled to do it so that we could have a range. And I think that that range is really critical. So everybody can sort of figure out where they're sitting at. And again, it gives you that information that you need to be able to really uh, put forth the best position. So if somebody asked me like, hey, it, you know, would you go and volunteer this information? I'm not going around doors. Don't get me wrong. Like knocking on random people's doors saying, let's sit down and talk about how much we made this year. But there are a few people in my circle that I trust and that we're all sort of in the same group and we do communicate about it. And I think it's helped all of us. And we've all stayed at Plunkett, right? So if that's, if that's any indication, it's not as if we've used the information to then go leverage against the company or to leave or because we're upset. It's helpful to know that you know, we're all, nobody's an outlier. And, uh, and if they are, then they have the opportunity to get it addressed. Excellent. Seems like the team that plays together stays together. What Anyone overall home? is, and this is kind of our last question in, in the formal discussion, and we'll open the floor up to any general comments or questions, but what overall are some recommendations for women to be better self-advocates in the workplace? obviously including compensation, but also overall anything else in terms of professional development we could be doing and paying it forward or taking upon ourselves to learn from. 
I think one of the biggest things is to be affable. And I know that that sounds really simple, but part of the reason why I think I, my career sort of skyrocketed at Plunkett um, was because I got along with everybody there, including a particularly demanding boss. Um, and I was friends with the people in the healthcare group. So now when their physicians have employment issues, they call me. And I was friends with the people in the no-fault group. So if their you know, car accident clients have random employment issues, they call me. And so that really helped me expand and build my book of business. And I'm not totally extroverted. So it was not always easy for me to do those things, but I just tried to have fun, to be myself, to be straightforward and to build those relationships. Because I think that the relationships are gonna help you figure out the information you need to better position yourself in terms of compensation, get more name recognition in the firm, which is a huge deal. And generally, you know, build your book of business, build your relationships. Name recognition is, you know, I mentioned that it was a huge deal because it, it is. Um, you know, I, I, again, don't want, I'm trying to stay humble here and I don't want anybody to think I'm up here on my soapbox talking about how great I am. But I think if there's one thing that allowed me to be so successful, it was just plain people knowing who I was. Because it's so easy to get lost in the mix. And I have sat on panels and I have been present in shareholder meetings. And if, if the group doesn't know you, I mean, we're all human beings. We tend to like the people we know. We tend to you know, go towards the sense of familiarity. And if something is unfamiliar, then we tend to put it in, in line with an archetype. And so it's really easy if you don't know somebody or if somebody doesn't know you and they wanna archetype you as so-and-so who has this issue to just dismiss it out of hand. Once we get to know each other, we're much more kind, we're much more understanding, we're, we're much more compassionate, and we do tend to be better advocates. So I always, I always want to tell younger attorneys and people that I work with, make sure that the people know you and truly know you on an authentic level, um, because that will go a really long way in, in improving every aspect of your work experience. Fantastic. And I think that's a great way to, to surmise this entire discussion from the from the structured questions too, is, is pay it forward, be kind, get people to know you, um, get to know other people as well. So definitely opening up the floor now to, we've got a couple of minutes left for questions during the recording session. And then once the recording session is over, we'll have a, a brief networking and formal event, but giving the opportunity for anyone to either unmute themselves and ask the question or put it in the chat and I can I can put the question forward. And I think if we're waiting for a moment, something that I just thought of while we were having this presentation is I, I learned so much in a short amount of time, you broke down these, these almost elusive concepts or difficult concepts for us as women in the profession to understand, to learn from, and then pay it forward. So, so very informative and really appreciate your insights today, Courtney. Yeah, no, it's, it's my pleasure. And I don't want to try to, you know, sound too simplistic or conversely, you know, sort of hammer the same points, but I think there are certain themes um, that can, you know, traverse through a lot of this. I also think sometimes it just boils down to, you know, having a takeaway point. Like not long ago, we hired a particular person and I thought candidly that that person was overpaid. And I am not a complainer because I wanna be so affable. I am a people pleaser to my core, but this was one particular issue that I decided that I, I would be heard. And I, I heard through the grapevine that the, you know, the ultimate takeaway was Courtney thinks that she's as valuable as X. And I did, but I had this long winded four hour presentation basically about, you know, all these different things that are going on and why this and why that, and it got boiled down into one sentence. So my, another thing that I would, I would just caution everybody is whether it's good, whether it's bad, be prepared to have whatever you present boiled down to one sentence. So what is that sentence going to be? Is it going to be something that's like threatening? If we don't pay her acts, she's out the door. Is it gonna be something that's really inspiring? You know, she's prepared to stay here for her career. If we can demonstrate that we have a commitment to her, is it gonna be something that's comparative? You know, why is she paid differently than X if their value is very comparable? Um, so no matter what you do and how you present it, everybody's gonna take one thing away from that. And so the way you present it, the, the way you go about it, uh, you know, you want to make sure you have that last sentence in mind, because that's ultimately going to be the takeaway. 
And I also, you know, I know my managing partner well, and I can tell you, he has told people before with like the threatening uh, negotiation tactics, there's the door. So if you are going to go that route where everything's going to boil down to, if we don't do X, then she's going to walk. Make sure that you're prepared for that response uh, before it gets to that point. Sometimes it's totally necessary. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes you reach a point where you got to draw a line in the sand. And if they don't want you, they don't want you. But if you do draw that line in the sand, make sure that you understand a personality on the other side, because I have seen firsthand um, the, 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 the finger point to the door. And I think that's an excellent way to, to wrap up the formal portion of our presentation, especially as we go for food for thought, that one sentence, what will people be saying about us and our careers and how we move forward? Um, I thank everyone for being present today, especially a warm thank you for Courtney Nichols and all her insights and time today. And with this, this concludes our formal presentation for our first session of Fearless Conversations. Thank you. Please join us again next month, same time and place for our second installment for Fearless Conversations.